Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome VP Worldwide Education Microsoft, Anthony Salcito. Hello and welcome to Hack the Classroom. I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We've got an amazing program filled with great innovators and amazing educators. Hack the Classroom is all about celebrating ideas that connect students to help achieve more every day in the classroom. We're going to be share, sharing new tips and tricks that you can use in your classroom tomorrow. And this day is all about celebrating. We've got some amazing educators joining us. So thanks very much for being part of this event. Now, one of the things I want to do is give a shout out. First off, we've got a great studio audience here on our Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining, everyone. But that's not it. We've got over 10,000 educators all around the world. We've got viewing parties that are happening all around the world in places like Korea and the Philippines, Indonesia, Czech Republic, the Ukraine, the US, the UK, Canada. Certainly, we've got folks in Russia and Georgia, LATAM, the United Arab Emirates, and Vietnam. Thanks very much for joining. Shout out to all of you. Thanks for being amazing educators every single day. I also want to encourage you to make sure that you share your uh, viewing parties with us throughout the day and throughout the program so we can celebrate and give you a shout out later on today. Now, one of the things I also want to recognize is we've got 26 Microsoft stores here in the US and beyond that are also celebrating. Thanks for all of you guys in the stores. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for all the folks in the stores uh, who really represent Microsoft every single day uh, to educators and students. Now, one of the things about this program, it's really going to be an interactive showcase. Well, before I get started, let me go through a little bit of housekeeping. So those of you who are joining online, I want to go through a little bit of the tour of the site. Behind, below me, there are purple buttons. Those purple buttons are all things you can do to be interactive throughout the session. If you want to ask a question or participate in the IM chat throughout the briefing, please do so. You can certainly ask technical questions if you need help participate in polls throughout the day. So keep, please be active. This is all about being interactive. I also want to put a shout out to the Hack the Classroom Twitter handle, hashtag Hack the Classroom. Share your thoughts and ideas throughout the program, and certainly uh, we want to hear from you throughout the day. I also want to give a shout out to the buttons above me. These are resource buttons and, and certainly really good resources from our partners. One of the things about Hack the Classroom was made possible from the great support of great sponsors. And I want to recognize and give the shout out. And throughout the session and after the session, you can certainly click the big links to get resources from our partners. Partners like Edmodo, Chalk.com, Steelcase, Bet, and ISTE are all really making this event possible. So thanks to them. Check out the resources there. One of the other things that we have is a resource button. There are going to be great resources that you're going to learn about today. Hopefully, you can implement them in, in the classroom uh, after Hack the Classroom. We're going to hear from Class Hacks as well. Click on that resource button, and one of the great resources that I'm really excited to share is a Sway of today's event. Sway has been an amazing tool. I've actually seen teachers and students using Sway in amazing ways in classrooms throughout the world, and it's a product that was really inspired by teachers and the work that you do in classrooms every single day. I'm excited to be joined by Preeta Williman from the Sway team, a program manager for the Sway team, who's actually going to be creating a Sway from today's event. So share your pictures. She's going to be building that Sway. Let's take a look from Preeta. Frida, how's it, how's it going there? Hey, everyone. So today, I'll be creating Sway of today's speakers and activities. It's something that you can either dial into to watch me build in real time or just use after the fact as a resource for anything that you've missed. So for those of you who haven't actually heard of Sway before, it's a brand new app from Office, completely free for schools as part of Office 365, that enables teachers and students to create beautiful, interactive multimedia documents that can easily be shared. All you need is a browser in order to create and view them, and they reflow on any device. They're extremely easy to create, and to nail that in, I'll show you real fast just how easy it is. So I'll, if we move into the demo, I'll create a new Sway right here. And so for any astronomy nerds out there, you might have heard some of the excitement over the last couple of days about the possibility of life on one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. And so here I have my Sway, and I will title it Europa. Um, this is extremely exciting news. And one of the great parts about Sway is that it's actually searching around the web for content related to what I'm writing about. And so here I can disambiguate for the app. No, I'm not writing about Europa, the rocket, or the mythological feature. I want the moon. And so what it's doing right now is pulling in images from around the web, Bing, Flickr, um, as well as other things like the Wikipedia page, YouTube videos that are relevant, tweets so that I can share the excitement with others. And I can just add all of that content right here. 
And kind of what Sway does is doing for me is actually handling all the nitty gritty aspects of layout for me. So already I can preview what I've built so far and it's already chosen a nice, just tight layout of all of my photos, um, videos, I can play them right now. Um, and there's a lot more you can do with Sway. I can choose a design that I'd like or a layout. Um, I won't go into all the details now, but I will say that if you're curious to get more details or training on how to use Sway in the classroom, please check out the Microsoft Educator portal and there's a training course there for you. Um, so now we'll actually go into the Sway that we will be using today, Microsoft Hack the Classroom. And if the studio audience will oblige, I will take a quick photo of you all right now. Smile. And since I have my phone synced with OneDrive, I just go right in here into my camera roll. And in one second, I will see the photo that we took earlier. And I can add that to my sway. There we go. Um, and boom, that's the beginning of our Microsoft Hack the Classroom Sway. So all you need to do for those viewing online, you'll see a link at the bottom of your screens, aka.ms slash sway the hack. And so as I said, you'll be able to watch me build it in real time or just circle back at the end. And at the end of the event, we'll be showing the sway that we have today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Preeta. That looks amazing. And I'm excited to see that sway and really your contributions to it throughout the day. One of the exciting things that we're going to share on this way is the work that we're doing at the Microsoft Education Workshop. At Microsoft, we have an education workshop team that's thinking every day about how we can bring hacks and celebrate the power of STEM in education. They're working on a project called Hacking STEM, and we're going to be celebrating it today in this room. Just down the hall, we've got Karen Weber, Senior Director from the Microsoft Education Workshop team, Jordan Shapiro, an education thought leader. They're going to be working on projects throughout the day. Let's check in with them now. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I'm really excited to be here. I have all these toys that I'm playing with here, like straws and sticks, and we got a bunch of teachers back here working on the same things. This is a makerspace, Karen. Where else do we have makerspaces? Actually, we are, have makerspaces happening in Seoul, Korea this morning, in Edinburgh, Scotland, and in Prague, uh, the Republic of Czechoslovakia, and they are all making the exact same project. They are all working on animometers, which are small... Anima? Anemometers. You can actually say that word pretty easily if you put the syllables on your fingers. Anemometers. Anemometers. Okay. Um, and what those are are small devices by which you can measure wind. The interesting thing about this is that they are all made, as, as Jordan was saying, out of everyday objects. Paper cups, straws, uh, spools, um, and then some small electronics that we'll have teachers then use as well. Wow, this is this is really exciting. I want you to tell me all about what this is, because I'm confused. Like, it looks like paper cups and sticks. Tell me how it goes from sticks and paper cups to an anemometer. Well, what's cool about it is once you've done some basic mechanical engineering and building your anemometer, we've hooked it up to some electronics. In this case, a little reed switch, and there's a little uh, magnet over here. And when the magnet crosses across the reed switch, we can actually ro ca calculate the rotations per uh, minute. So there's like a magnet sending an electronic signal to these wires here? And, yes, and then they're going into this breadboard, which in the breadboard is going into an Arduino. And when I power it up with my handy little hair dryer here, <laughs> what you're good. actually getting is actually calculating the wind speed. And if I look on my Excel spreadsheet, what you can see is it actually doing that live, being able to tell me how many rotations are per minute and what the um, kilometers per hour are. If I go up on a higher speed, we're actually getting about 150 kilometers an hour. That's, that's really cool. Can I try something? Yeah. Tell me how quickly I blow out candles when it's a cake, okay? Oh, that was only like 13 kilometers, 13 rotations per minute, not very much, well, and less than a half a kilometer an hour. <laughs> but still, now I know. You sure I didn't did. know that. I've never known that before. Well, you know, what's interesting is that you bring that up, is how do we determine what, how, how fast the wind is blowing? And that's the Beaufort scale. And so what's interesting is we'll be able to take this and determine, based on the Beaufort scale, what the wind speed is. So tell me, like, I mean, I've never imagined you could do this with such simple materials. Wait, like, what, like, how did how did you come up with the idea to use these simple materials to do such an amazing, like, this is a classroom project. I can imagine my kids doing it. I can, I can imagine even younger kids than my kids doing it. Well, this is part of a one-week hackathon project. You know, Microsoft has a, a week every year where 
employees and their partners are allowed to think about doing something that they think is really important. And this for us is a hack for good. So I partnered with two teachers, two students, and an amazing team of engineers here at Microsoft. And we figured out not only this project and the content, um, which has got a lesson plan that's included in it and the instructions, but also the technology to allow us to build the plug into Excel to be able to then build this worksheet. So, and it's a hack for good, I guess, because it makes it so inexpensive for so many people to do a very similar project. Yeah, I mean, the fact that anybody anywhere in the world would have these everyday objects, whether they're in their kitchen or in their pantry or in their garage, we think that that now starts to make um, STEM and STEM education accessible to everyone. Yeah, I mean, like, like I generally think of these kind of projects. You kind of go, oh, well, you have to be, you have tons of money for a school to be able to do these kinds of projects, or you have to be a, a tech genius to be able to do these kinds of projects. But you just show me that I can, that almost anyone can do this really simply. Well, and the fact that it goes into Excel, and Excel is part of the uh, O365 education suite, we think that that now makes it completely accessible for everyone. Yeah, and, and the, the other thing that I think about is like so often when we're talking about these STEM engineering and think about Excel and all and, and these tech things, we tend to think of it as separate from kind of the natural world. This is so natural. Like we're looking at wind. You don't get more natural than wind. We're actually <laughs> celebrating four uh, 21st century technical skills here, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, and data science. And the fact that you can do one project and experience all four of those technical skills, we think is pretty amazing. I, th I think it's pretty amazing. And I hear all the, I hear all the scissors <laughs> behind us. I see all these teachers getting, getting, getting super excited. I mean, they're like giggling. I mean, it's fun. So I think what's going to be cool is we're going to come back in a little while and we're going to see how the teachers have been doing and check in and see how their anemometers are. And I think at this point we'll then throw it back to Anthony. All right, go ahead, Anthony. Wow, Jordan and Karen, that looks amazing. And I'm excited to see how things are shaping up in a little later. One of the things that we're going to celebrate throughout today's event is hacks. And we've had a class hack competition that's been running leading up to Hack the Classroom. And I'm going to celebrate three hacks today. And these really represent amazing creativity that we see on display from educators every single day in their classrooms. We're going to share the first hack from a, a great teacher in New Zealand, El Subash, who's really figured out a great way and tip to help you use Office Mix every single day. Let's check it out. Hey, folks. In this uh, little clip, I'm going to show you guys how to write straight in Office Mix. Take this example here. I'm really struggling to write this in a straight line. Well, some people might like to argue, but for me, this is still not straight. When I add a grid, you can see again how crooked this writing is. So before you start slide recording, just paste a transparent grid in the background and then go into slide recording. Now when you're slide recording, you have a little grid in the background, which means your writing is actually a lot more straight and it's a lot more ordered and structured. And now comes the hack, guys. You need to select the grid, cut it or delete it, and then you can actually export to video or upload to Office Mix. And now you shall have a video where all the writing is straight, ordered, and structured. And that's my class hack for writing straight in Office Mix and PowerPoint. Thank you. That's a great hack. I know I'm going to be using that to make my Office Mixes even better. Uh, we're going to be sharing all the hacks today, as well as the ones that were we'll, uh, submitted for the Hack the Cl Classroom competition on the educator community. Many of you are a part of the educator community. If you're not, I hope you join us. Become a Microsoft Innovative Educator. We have a number of Microsoft Innovative Educators experts in the house today. Let's give a shout out to MIEs. MIEs. And I know we've got many Microsoft Innovative Educators throughout the world that are joining us today. This is going to be an interactive discussion throughout. And I want to put a shout out to our question and answer uh, chairs that are in, in the room here that will be monitoring questions online and taking live studio audience questions. Let's give a shout out to Eve and Sonia, who will be handling questions today. Now, we're going to have questions after our next speaker. And it really is a tremendous pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Now, hacks are all about bringing creativity, creative solutions to problems. And our next speaker is actually dubbed Mr. Creativity by The Economist. He has a really rich background as a musician, a psychiatrist, a thought leader and professor. And really, in his day job as CEO of Edgemakers, his job is really to help inspire students to drive innovation and become leading innovators around the world. It's a great pleasure to join our first speaker, John Cao. John, thanks for joining today. John Cao, sorry. 
Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Well, as someone who's been identified with the topic of innovation for some 30 years, it was an irresistible invitation to come to a conference that had the word hack in the title. Uh, you know, hack, I guess if we deconstruct it a little bit, uh, signifies an unauthorized intrusion into some kind of computer system or network. And in a way, innovation is an unauthorized intrusion into the existing uh, scheme of things. Uh, Wikipedia defines hacker culture as one where individuals enjoy the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming the limitation of existing systems to achieve novel results. And that's innovation uh, as well. So my uh, topic uh, today is twofold. Uh, it's about innovating education. Uh, as I said, you know, I've, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of innovation efforts around the world in a variety of different contexts, and I'd like to share some of that uh, by way of stage setting for the uh, session today. But my also, I want to share my personal passion, which is about educating for innovation. And I want to make the case that actually educating for innovation can become an engine for the educational establishment to innovate itself. So I want to kind of make an equation between those two uh, factors. We are in an era of profound change. Incremental innovation, incremental change really isn't going to do it. And the forces are already in play to drive change forward, whether the education institution of education responds proactively or not. And I think we're here to devise proactive uh, approaches to innovating education. But you think about the tsunami of venture capital that's flowing into uh, education innovation. You think about all of the disruptions that are being caused by an avalanche of digital uh, technology, the forces of disintermediation, which are creating new substitutes for educational experiences. And almost a, a way in which learning and education are beginning to separate and beginning, are beginning to be visible in very discrete kinds of ways. And the waves of change, we have to say, are quite profound. So we have to innovate. We have no choice. But the question is, what is innovation? And whereas it's one of the most commonly used words in the lexicon, I often find that even very senior leaders have trouble defining it, let alone saying anything useful about how to do it. So what I'd like to do is share with you a definition of innovation that I hope can be sort of navigational beacons for the discussion that is to follow. So for me, uh, innovation is about developing capabilities, whether they're at the individual level, whether they're at the interpersonal level, whether they're at the enterprise level, or even whether they're at the level of a country, a national shall we say, innovation agenda. And what kind of uh, capabilities? Well, for me, they're about the ability, cultivating the ability to achieve a desired future. You know, innovation has to be about something. It has to be about something you want. Otherwise, it's just good hygiene, like going out and brushing your teeth, in a way. So this notion of innovation as serving a purpose, I think, is extremely important as well. Um, you know, obviously, innovation is about Creativity, generating ideas, developing them, and realizing value. It's creativity applied to purpose to realize value. That's the dictionary definition. But I think this notion of continuously realizing a desired future is what we want in order to address this, you know, what the literature calls the wicked problem of education. It's so complex, there's so many opinions, there's so many stakeholders that we ourselves need different ways of thinking about how to do innovation in order to get to uh, the, the far shore. Innovation is also complicated because it isn't just one thing that's happened at one point in history. So, I mean, I could spend an hour talking to this uh, uh, set of ideas, but I'll just summarize very quickly for you the, the notion that we learn about innovation often because of an industrial model of innovation, you know, that we have manufacturing improvement, learning curves, and so forth and so on, the factory model. But in fact, in the 60s, beginning in the 60s with Silicon Valley and high tech, we entered into what I call the world of the killer app, the high-tech innovation, innovation 2.0, now transitioning into what I would call 3.0, human-centered innovation, where the focus is not on the widget or the technology or the algorithm or the killer app, but it's on the person. It's the kid in the classroom. It's the parent struggling at home. It's the teacher trying to make something happen within the uh, confines of the system as it is, the administrator that's trying to lead a district somewhere uh, new. And interestingly enough, I believe this is also the journey 
of innovation for education. You know, you have the factory model sitting in rows facing the front, metric standardized testing, giving way to an avalanche of new digital, primarily digital tools, techniques, focusing on the killer app. But now I think we have to go back to basics. How do we redesign the experience of learning so that it serves the purposes of all of the students in relation to the challenges of the 21st century? This is part of the wicked problem, right? So, you know, I'll show you a few vignettes of classrooms. You know, we're familiar with this, and it hasn't changed very much uh, over the uh, decades and over the centuries, really. Um, but now we have, quote unquote, classrooms, which are hackathons. This is a, you know, sort of a hackathon picture with much more of that notion of improvisation and form following function. And then we have this notion of the classroom in the palm of your hand. So this notion that, uh, you know, here's a young uh, lady who obviously is not from a highly privileged background, but all the world's knowledge can appear on that digital device. So it's basically turning the education process, if you will, inside out, you know, and the classroom is everywhere. The notion of going from learning as an event to learning as flows to whatever is available whenever you want it at the, at the palm of your hand. And we also have a short piece of video, which is my fourth classroom vignette, which if we could roll in a moment, I will then deconstruct for you. So that's not a traditional classroom. That's actually my living room. It's my 11-year-old's, uh, uh, it was his 11th birthday party with three of his uh, closest friends. Uh, it's a collaborative Minecraft uh, environment. And, you know, just notice engagement, immersion, uh, a highly collaborative process, lots of empathy, lots of uh, social learning, group teaching, and so forth and so on. So this whole notion that a class, you know, much as we talked about hacking the classroom, we have to talk about the classroom because obviously uh, it has changed. And in relation to those three eras, you know, you have the classroom as factory, the classroom as the repository for killer apps, and now the classroom as a container for human experiences, that's a variable, not a given, right? And these are the vectors of innovation that I think are really important to consider. Now, educating for innovation. And why is it important? Well, I've written elsewhere, I actually wrote a whole book about this called Innovation Nation, which is about America's innovation agenda and what we needed to do to get our act together. It's the age of innovation because there are at least 50 countries around the world, and I'm so happy that we have a global audience out there uh, participating in this event because they'll recognize the importance of this statement as well, which is that there are countries around the world that are building national innovation capability like it's going out of style. You know, you have China's, for instance, that uh, the countries like China that are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in innovation agendas and smart, small, smaller countries like Finland or Singapore that are positioning themselves as innovation hotspots. And what I say all the time to leadership is if you want innovation and you want to build innovation capability, you have to have people who know how to do it. And if you want people who know how to do it, you have to help them learn how to do it, right? I mean, you can have policies, you can have infrastructure, but if you don't have people, innovation isn't going to happen. And the big gap out there is that up until recently, there's been no really systematic learning regime for innovation. The reason that I started Edgemakers was basically to create an integrated, purpose-driven, practice-based system to help young people, middle school students, high school students, college students, engage in meaningful learning activities around innovation and to fill in this gap between what students are learning in school today and what they need to thrive in the 21st century, which I think we can agree, you know, that that's a fairly yawning gap, as is the question of how to build engagement in a world where the richness of digital experience outside the classroom far exceeds mostly the richness of experience inside the classroom. So the notion of going to school every morning can feel like a penalty box in terms of actual learning, right? I'd rather play Minecraft with my friends than go sit and, in a row and you know, take a math quiz. So here's the question that I've been dealing with personally for the last four years. This has become my obsession, which is what if the world's young people 
learned how to be innovators and entrepreneurs. You know, my personal mission statement now is to empower young people everywhere to become highly skillful innovators so they can make a difference ahead of schedule. There's nothing in the rule book that says that if you're 12 or 15 or 18, that you can't contribute to the world's issues. And Gen Z knows that the world is, you know, to put it politely, kind of a mess, and that it's their responsibility to do something about it. And should education not serve those purposes? Should education not, in a sense, be about uh, being embedded in a new model of civics and citizenship, which is about engagement and making change and generating creative ideas? Uh, otherwise, what is education really for? So Edgemakers is built around a very straightforward framework. You know, we, I, I like to test myself by trying to explain innovation to you know, kids, like 10-year-olds. And what I say in those situations is not some big intellectual Harvard thing, but you know, it's plant, grow, harvest. You generate an idea, you put a seed in the ground, you cultivate it, hopefully it grows, and then you have to take it to market and somebody pays for it, whether it's a social payment or a, an economic payment. So to kind of break that down for you and to show the integrated nature of what I believe innovation learning has to be about, we have a number of different curricula that start with ideation and creativity. So that's the origination, that's the plant. And then the grow, there are a number of disciplines. So why is design such a big deal? Well, because designers know how to put a form on ideas so that they can be shared and they can be worked on iteratively. Why storytelling? Because story makes ideas influential so that you can persuade other people that they're worth working on or that you, know, you should join the company or buy the product or whatever. Character and collaboration. Who am I? Who are you? How do we work together to make one plus one equal 10? And then finally, entrepreneurship, which is nothing more or less than the ability to realize value from ideas. And this is where lean startup and uh, business plans and you know, uh, the, the like kind of come into play. It's only when you integrate all of these disciplines into a unified framework that you can, I believe, really talk convincingly about what innovation is all about. So there is a real set of disciplines to innovation as well as the bumper sticker about how great it is and how important it is and so forth and so on. There are many people out there who talk about the what of innovation and even the why, but there are relatively few people who talk about the how in very kind of granular terms. So that's what Edgemakers is all about. Edgemakers is all about category busting. I mean, in a way, if I could get rid of the word innovation, I would because it's got so much baggage. So, you know, this kind of slide playfully makes that point. You know, there's design, there's change, there's invention, there's ingenuity, there's edge making. It's very important in the classroom that the uh, knowledge shared be practice-based. This is not a theoretical discipline. Um, Anthony mentioned my engagement with music. I, I know myself that you can't learn how to play jazz piano by uh, seeing a PowerPoint presentation, reading a book, or hearing a lecture. You have to sit down at the piano and play, you know, preferably for about 10 years, before you have a shot at sounding good. So, the idea that you could treat innovation like a theoretical discipline with quizzes about definitions and stuff goes about this far. Doing the work in the classroom, and by the way, this is not a big esoteric set of disciplines for teachers to practice. There are very simple, straightforward activities that teachers can do in the classroom tomorrow that are about these deep skills of innovation and are practice-based learning opportunities. Maybe we can talk about them uh, in the Q&A that's to follow. And finally, Innovation, as I said earlier, has to be about something. It has to be purpose-driven. So the effort in our curriculum development has been to put this notion of uh, wicked problems, societal challenges, and to suffuse it into the curriculum all the way through. So sustainability, for instance, which is the generational challenge of our age in some respects, is suffused throughout the curriculum to arouse a spirit of activism in young people at the earliest possible age. I mean, we like to say that the idealism and passion of young people is one of the most wasted assets on the planet. You know, society has to process them for 10 or 15 years until they're given permission to be able to go out there and make stuff happen. We don't believe that. And we believe that giving them the tools in the classroom to accomplish great things is uh, really uh, one of the best things we could possibly do. So I started by saying that there was a, a wave of disruptive change. Education was a wicked problem. We had to be innovative to address it. And here's the great wave by Hokusai, you know, the wave that threatens to engulf the little ships that are uh, driven by the tiny little people who seem powerless to 
influence the course of events, right? And so that is, in a way, one picture of our situation. But the, th the thought that I want to leave you with is that wicked problems turned on their head become wicked opportunities. Yeah, most people don't realize the Hokusai painting, if you turn it upside down, there's a little yin-yang thing going on there. So wicked problems define wicked opportunities. And that's why I'm so happy that Hack the Classroom is here to basically enable us to think about how to convert the wicked problem of education into a wicked opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Yeah, Thank you so much. Good. Let's have okay. a seat, Let's and we're going to have a chat with John here. So those of you online, uh, now is put in your questions. Hopefully, you've been putting, you've been putting your questions in as uh, John was speaking. I have tons of questions, <laughs> but I'm going to only ask one, and then I'm going to open it to the audience, so live audience. I hope someone's brave enough to step up to that mic in a minute. So my first question, John, and yes, it's because you brought this up. I know, I'm, I'm putting my teacher hat on, so you have inspired me. I want to go back to my classroom and think about how I can give my children wicked problems to think about. If I was any one of these teachers that is here today or the thousands that are watching online, what's something that they could do next week to add some innovation into their classroom? Well, I think first it's understanding the framework and understanding what the tools are in the toolbox. So there are ways to uh, acquire that information online, websites and so forth and so on, edgemakers.com. But the main thing is to understand that there is an opportunity to relate innovation to something that the students care about and think is important in their immediate environment that they can work on right away. So an exercise, for instance, that we love is uh, getting the students to talk about what is waste, where does it come from, and then beginning to track waste in the classroom, and then brainstorming about what you could do to mitigate waste and what it means in terms of sustainability in the classroom, in the school, in the community, in society, right? That it's very rich, but it starts with looking in the wastebasket. Or um, book bags, you know, I mean, most uh, kids that I know are not satisfied with their book bags. So let's have a design charrette around inventing a better book bag. And then there's the systems question about where do the book bags go? I mean, most schools I go to, the book bags are all over the place. You know, they look the same. People take home somebody else's book bag. And then there's the entrepreneurial piece of, and the change-making piece of, well, should we go talk to the administration? Are there rules around uh, uh, book bags? And, and all of a sudden, you can take something apparently very simple and unpack it into a very rich project-based learning environment for innovation. Wow. So there you go, teachers. You guys have some ideas to put in front of your students next week. So think about those wicked problems. So I'm ready for some uh, questions. I see Richard in our audience has a question. Good morning. Good morning. Hi to everyone in Las Vegas, NCE family. Hey. So. <laughs> I think everyone wants to be innovative, but what can happen is that fear can creep in, fear of not enough supplies or time or resources or just fear of it falling flat. How do you talk to teachers or audiences that want to be innovative, but where fear is real or it's perceived as being real? Well, I think first of all, uh, let's unpeel your question a little bit more and make the point that everyone is creative. It's wired into who we are as human beings. We can't really help it. The question is how we uh, apply that creativity to something practical, which is more the innovation side of the spectrum. And there, you know, there is no algorithm for risk management. There's really only a heuristic, a sense of balance. So obviously, we can't um, go uh, so far out on a limb that it won't just be easy to saw off, but it'll break and you'll fall down. But by the same token, if you take no risk and simply do things the existing way, not only is that um, not innovating, but it actually is a kind of a static mindset that actually creates, I think, less exciting learning experiences for students and ultimately less excitement for the teacher themselves. I mean, the thing that's been so interesting to me over the last three or four years as I've gotten more deeply into this is how teachers respond to the notion of providing innovation learning for themselves, because in a way, it gives them the framework through the side door of becoming change agents as well. So, you know, it's like playing a jazz solo. You know, if you don't take any risks, it sounds like elevator music. If you take too many risks, it sounds like weird music that only a few of us would appreciate because we're really, you know, kind of hip to what's going on with jazz today. And, you know, the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Jazz musicians always talk about the sweet spot. And so risk management is a sweet spot uh, uh, phenomenon and requires practice. So that's the other thing. You know, there are myriad exercises and activities for uh, learning what your risk preferences are by experiencing those situations, as opposed to reading about in a book, which is pretty useless. 
Awesome. Thank you. We're almost out of time, so we only have time for one question. Eve, our online audience. Yeah, we have a lot of questions online. Everybody's very inspired. We have a, a couple of questions. One, um, they're, they're a little bit similar. Sukhes Kamath from India and also Vicky Morgado from Canada are asking a similar question. They're all inspired by your message about inspiring creativity and innovation in the classroom, but they are all working within the constraints of the typical classrooms and typical school C C C systems that are very bureaucratic and exam driven. So how can they start making small changes? Well, it's a very good question. And the idea of creating a course is uh, somewhat indigestible to a lot of school systems because adopting new curriculum is very difficult. So one of the uh, uh, approaches that we've used is basically to take all of our learning assets and deconstruct them into small molecules that can be recombined in small learning uh, units or modules of one kind or another. So I think the notion that a teacher can in any event, this is not about taking some big leap from A to Z and then you're done. This is about the incrementalism of adopting something new, learning from it, going further, trying something new, uh, learning from that, probably making uh, false starts, side trips, but all in the, in the same uh, direction. And there are many, many small bite-sized places to get started and to do these experiments. Just asking questions of the students so they can take more responsibility for their learning and they can uh, get into a kind of a Socratic mindset with regard to each other and the teacher on what is uh, a wicked problem that is downscaled for their immediate surroundings would be a great start. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, John. Thank you. This was fantastic. Yeah, I pleasure. look forward to seeing, hearing from more from you. Okay. Um, thanks, guys. And back, Anthony, back to you. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks, John, for a really great discussion, an important discussion on what we need to do to inspire the magic inside of students' creativity and harness that every day in the classroom. I want to make sure that I remind you that this today's session is being recorded, so you can share it with colleagues and peers after the fact. Watch any of the materials. Watch John's great presentation again. Uh, before we move on, I want to do some more shout-outs. We've got some great folks who are participating. I've seen some early morning shots from folks in New Zealand, uh, folks joining us from Cyprus, Cyprus and Mauritius. The Microsoft Store in Toronto, shout out to you guys. Uh, so it's great to see the energy enthusiasm continue to leverage the Hack the Classroom hashtag at hashtag Hack the Classroom. Bring more photos in for Prita's sway that she's building later on uh, that we'll share with you. Now, before we get to the next session, I want to remind you that this is all about hacking. And one of my favorite hacks is actually something that was born out of the Microsoft Hackathon that Karen mentioned earlier, where we bring Microsoft folks in, passionate about amazing subjects, trying to make the world a better place. And one of the areas that many Microsoft employees gravitate towards is making the world better in education. And one hack that actually won Microsoft's hackathon last year is learning tools. And learning tools has really been about really bringing the, the power of reading to students of, uh, of, uh, in the world of education. And certainly students who have dyslexia, students who want to uh, understand how to read better, uh, learning tools has been a very, very powerful tool. Uh, really connected to the power of OneNote. We've got a lot of OneNote Avengers in the house, I know. Shout out to OneNote Avengers uh, around the world, uh, and thanks for the support of OneNote. And I'm going to share an amazing example of how learning tools can make an impact. There's an educator, Lauren Pittman, uh, in Holly Springs uh, Elementary in Canton, Georgia, who's been using OneNote to really inspire her students to read better. She's a special education teacher in Georgia, and we're going to learn a little bit more about her story. Let's roll the video. What did we start talking about yesterday, guys? St. Patrick's Day! I am a resource special education teacher. I target groups of students who need intervention for either reading, language arts, or math. These are kids that struggle every day. And to watch them grow and learn and have those aha moments oh, now I get it. is so rewarding to me, and it just makes my heart soar. We have ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia. I have a student who reads on a third grade level, but then I have a student who reads on a kindergarten level, and I have to find a way to bridge the gap. We've been using OneNote since the beginning of this school year. Even in this short amount of time that we've had it, it's been completely transformational. When we first started using OneNote, I thought, okay, this is gonna take us a while to get going, and you know, we're gonna have to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. Three days. It took them three days to master OneNote. I have a dyslexic student who's also dysgraphic. He still reads on a kindergarten level. You know, he's 10 years old, he's still learning sight words. And, you know, he would tell me all the time that he was stupid. When we started the school year, he read four words per minute. For the longest time, I struggled with 
how to help him. And when we got the learning tools with the immersive reader, he went to 22 words per minute. I never thought in one calendar school year that we would even get into double digits. And he's at 22 words per minute and he stayed there. For my students especially, it's really transformed their educational experience. I don't know what next year will look like. I don't know what our possibilities are because in my wildest dreams, I never thought this would be what it is. You know, the sky's the limit. Wow, I have seen that so many times, like we released that last spring, I believe. And um, I still, I get chills. I, those of you that are teachers know the, the, the struggle that you feel in your heart when you're really trying to get those kids that are so far below their grade level just to where they should be. And how can a student even learn when they are reading three words a minute? Could you imagine three words a minute? So Lauren, um, I am super excited to have you here today. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, um, now that we've seen this inspiration for what learning tools with OneNote and class notebooks can do, the question that I always hear from teachers though is, um, how do I even get started? So if you could just tell us a little bit about when were you first introduced to OneNote and how did you use it when you first started? Well, I was introduced to it in the 2013-14 um, school year. Um, our principal decided that our entire professional development for the year was gonna be the initial MIE certification. So we did that with our um, technology project specialist, Sandy Adams, and she's kind of like my uh, technology fairy godmother. This is my Cinderella story. <laughs> um, and I had never heard of it before until I took the initial MIE. And then when she showed it to me, I was like, okay, this is what's going to be the game changer for us. And um, from there, uh, we started small. I started with just a notebook for myself and then created the one for the students. And now it's just become, you know, its own. Yeah. It's on. So you were using OneNote uh, for yourself first, and then you started using it with students. But when you first started using it with the students, there were no learning tools, right? No, there were no learning tools. So what lessons did you learn? Or just before I get into that, talk to me what life was like before learning tools. What did you do? Um, I spent a lot of time after school, like um, two, sometimes three hours at a time, uh, recording all the text within the OneNote. So if it was a worksheet, I would record all the questions and the answers, or I would office lens a snip from the book and then record that. And so there were lots of arrows on our pages back then um, where they, <laughs> the recordings pointed to the question. And um, I, I did a lot of, a lot of prep work um, to, to get my students ready. Okay, so now then, what lessons did you learn as you started using OneNote with the students? And I'll get into the learning tools, what learning tools actually did here in a minute. But what lessons did you learn when you were first using OneNote with your students that you would like to share with the audience here who maybe haven't even started using OneNote yet? Um, remember that OneNote allows students to access independence. I think that was the big key for my kids is that I didn't have to be a helicopter teacher anymore. I didn't have to stand over them and point to things and read. They were able to do things for themselves. And for some of them, that is the most powerful thing that OneNote can give them. You know, they're, they're completely dependent upon you for their entire educational experience. And then this allows them to do things for themselves. It also allows them to stay organized, especially for those ADHD students who hand them something, you turn around and somehow it's magically disappeared into the universe. Yep. Yeah, they can't lose anything anymore. Um, but I think you're allowing them to access their education themselves in a way that's relevant and important to them. Awesome. So now Learning Tools was invented literally like a summer ago. And when did you start beta? You started beta testing last fall, was it? Or yeah. Um, yeah. Mike had actually um, found us on Twitter and you know sent me this article about how they won the hack and all that. And I was like, oh my God, it's coming. And I had previewed it on, um, I'm serious, like it was really exciting. I mean, I guess for me it was even more exciting because I was like, ha there's gonna be something that will actually work. Um, but 
we had previewed it in a surface call and I was like sitting on the other side, just like hysterically crying. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, somebody thought about my kids, you know, cause there's all kinds of technologies and things out there, but they're not accessible. Um, they're hard to make function with, you know, operating systems and things like that. And so when this came along, it was literally the push of a button and you turn it off with a push of a button and it has been the most powerful tool that yeah, so on the screen right now is a screenshot of some content that's in OneNote, and then with one push of the button, it goes into the immersive reader. And what does the immersive reader do for your students, Lauren? Well, it allows them to take text within things like PDFs, pictures, even things that they type within um, the canvas of OneNote, and turns it into readable material. And then what happens is with the push of a button, they can hear that material as many times as they want and as many times as they need, but it also allows them to access a background which helps um, with visual discrimination, especially for dyslexic students. You know, bright white paper, it's very hard for them to find text on a page. And so with all the options that we have, they can access it in a way that's relevant to them. They can change text size, spacing, and basically customize their reading experience for them. That's awesome. So I hear that now you make interactive textbooks for your students. So if you can really briefly talk about what is an interactive textbook in your classroom and kind of what do you do to put that together? Yeah, I will actually create a section in a notebook. Um, like we're doing a project right now on um, if you had animal ears. And so I've created a textbook with videos I found online or created office mixes from Brain Pops. Um, and basically collected all this material, created a textbook that's both interactive for them um, allows me to collect all of my lesson content and keep myself organized. And then it's also a resource that they can have later at home um, to work with their parents on a project that's kind of awesome coming okay, up. Okay, so we are about to open up for questions for online in the audience, but before we do, two things I wanna share with you. Uh, we have our Innovative Educator magazine, and Lauren actually wrote us an article in our newest edition that just came out this last week. So make sure you go onto our educator community and grab that so you can hear more from Lauren and what she's been doing with her kids. And as another special treat, we got Lauren in the uh, recording studio <laughs> two days ago. And literally last night, uh, we produced a video for all of you out there um, that's the top five tips from Lauren on how you can get started with OneNote, her tips, the things she learned, because it's about like John said earlier, learning from each other, having someone that has done that journey, done that road. So Lauren's done it. She's put this tip sheet together for you. It's a, a beautiful video. You have to watch it. And um, there's a PDF of lesson starter ideas, things that she does when she has a brand new batch of kids that have never touched OneNote to get them A, immersed in content immediately, and to B, learn OneNote as they're learning their content. So that can be found at aka.ms forward slash tips from Lauren. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren, for that. So let's go to questions. Do we have anybody um, in the audience out there in audience land? No, because everyone here loves OneNote, right, you guys? <laughs> yeah. Who here uses OneNote? Yeah, look at that. That audience right there. Uh, Eve, so I'm sure then we have to have questions coming in online. Yes, a lot of action online. Um, so a couple of people from the U.S., like Rob Thompson, is asking specifically about uh, the OneNote staff notebooks, if you use them to collaborate with other educators in your school. Actually, yes. Um, I am our uh, SPED department chair, and so I created an entire notebook this year for our department that has all of the resources we need for writing IEPs, student schedules, master documents, everything that we need to be uh, collaborative as a team. And I tell them, you know, we're going to use this as a staff because we have to set the example for the kids. So we're going to collaborate in OneNote just like they collaborate in OneNote. And it also helps us to be a lot more effective. We're no longer looking for documents and emails or asking for more paper copies. We're a cohesive unit. And so the staff notebook, especially for your colleagues, is very powerful um, to, to kind of pull that collaboration piece in for, for educators as well. Awesome. All right. Uh, any more? Uh, Eve, I would just say, yeah, we got time. We got... We got time, so let's get as many questions as we can. Or coming from uh, Ashley Holland, again in the U.S., she's asking uh, if uh, the students can use uh, uh, the OneNote lear learning tools to do their own interactive books or interactive stories. Actually, yes. So we use it a lot as an editing tool. So they'll go in and they'll write a piece, and then they'll actually listen back to what they've um, written because, you know, I feel like the editing part when you're doing writing is so hard for students because in their mind it sounds, oh yeah, that sounds great. Well, when they hear it back again and again, then they're like, oh, I really need to change this word or, oh, I really you know, need to add something there. And it's also really powerful because I tell my kids all the time, you know, they always forget punctuation, you know, 
if it continues in a stream like that, it makes them very aware of what's happening with the text. That's up. Yeah, and I've seen that a lot. Oh, yay. Hi, Robin. We have Robin out in the <laughs> audience now who's going to ask a question. Hi, I'm Robin, and I'm a resource teacher as well. But my experience, I'm in a big picture learning school with high schoolers, and I'm struggling with getting buy-in from the high schoolers using learning tools. Do you have any experience with high schoolers or the older kids in using learning tools? Um, I don't, but I do have a colleague that did, and what she kind of did was just slowly kind of integrate them into it and say, okay, for this particular thing today, this is the tool we're going to use. And once they had become a lot more familiar with it and they had kind of seen the power of it, they were a lot more apt to jump on board. Um, the other thing is, is that it's it's an individual experience, so it's not like they're having to share with everyone that that's, this is something that they're using. Um, so I think it's just it's a slow buy-in. And it's, you know, slowly getting them to kind of, you know, drink the Kool-Aid, so to say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think when high school students, they've, you know, been through school for a good 16 years. You know, they're 16 years into their life, and they're pretty set in what school is. And that's definitely a challenge. So, Rob, and I look forward to talking to you at the end of the school year and seeing how you got those high schoolers um, up and running with that. All right. Well, um, next up, uh, we have uh, Jordan and Karen are back in our uh, makerspace out there. So let's check in with Jordan and Karen and see what's going on. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was great. Listen, so we are back in the makerspace and we are a lot further along in the project and we're here with two teachers. Karen, introduce us. So we have Brian and Dustin, our Team Canada. They came down to, to be with us this morning. Um, and you guys have been working pretty hard. You went two different paths. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've done, Brian? Well, I started with the basic anemometer, and I learned through the process of actually constructing this thing that I can not only use it to just, you know, teach the mathematics of wind speed, but the mathematics that went into actually creating this thing, right down from uh, measuring the cup to intersecting lines to looking at the x, y, and the z axis there, I thought I could use oh, this. Oh, you have z, you must be, I see I told you they were from Canada, <laughs> right? right? The z, z axis. <laughs> uh, just to use it, just as a tool to engage kids in, you know, an unplugged maker activity using authentic mathematics. Right. Nice. So, so, and then and, and then you can use the read switch here for that too, right? Yes, yeah, so we just wait. Finished. I want to see if it works first. Okay, okay, right? okay. Let's, let's getting ahead of sure it works. Yeah. Nice, nice, right, so nice. What's I it say? I can see that you are going about 96, no, 80, 92, whatever uh, rotations per minute, um, and that you're at Beaufort scale one. Going one high. Let me see that. Going one. high. Yeah. Okay, so tell me how you take that to math. It's not just about science, right? It's not just about <laughs> science. So the math that you could actually use this uh, in a classroom to measure wind speed would be, first you want to figure out the uh, circumference of this circle because you need to determine how far the cup has actually traveled in one rotation. So you, you would use this dowel. Uh, as the diameter of that circle to find the circumference. And then you would multiply that circumference, that distance, by the number of rotations it actually does in one minute, convert that to kilometers by multiplying it by 0 .0001, uh, and then multiply it by 60 minutes to get a relative kilometer per hour wind speed from this model. That's incredible. I mean, like, I, I went through years and years of math, don't think, and that wouldn't have made sense to me until I saw <laughs> it done with that project, and, and it sounds like it's like three weeks worth of math that you just described. At least, very okay. cross-curricular. All right, now, you, now, now Dustin, yours has this Lego motor. Yeah, so we were able to create this wind speed simulator by attaching this Lego motor, which has a pulley that's, that powered, is powered by the Lego motor, and it rotates the straw. And what's amazing is we've, we've connected to our breadboard and our Arduino, and able to, within Excel, have Bing Maps and a visual database that makes the data visual, visual to us, and we can see we can see the wind displayed on our, on our uh, wind speed model here in real time. So we could go to our, to, uh, we have a maker lab in Prague. We yep. can see, we could get a sense let's here right, so of what the wind's so like in Prague. let's go see, simulate what the wind speed is like in Prague right now. So you'll probably see on the screen that the, all of a sudden there are X's instead of numbers, but that's because we're simulating the wind. But we're actually getting about three kilometers an hour uh, for the wind speed in, in Prague. We come over and we see how our friends in Seoul are doing. Let's see. Let's click on it. Oh, oh there's down a yeah. right? I need a scarf. <laughs> right. 17. Okay, how are our friends in Edinburgh? 
Oh my goodness, wow. 30 wow. kilometers wow. an hour. That's pretty awesome. Wow. So, it, so that's... what's interesting is that you basically took the same anemometer and by going two different paths, you actually got data coming into Collecting Excel. It. And we've, you've got data coming out of Excel into the anemometer to actually simulate that. Really interesting. What is surprising to me is also the fact that you've got the data science piece actually getting super robust from the next generation science standards. It's amazing. It's a, it's a deep learning activity for students, and I love how the technology in both ways can drive the learning, and students can connect it with it and see it and, and manipulate it and, and really simulate what's going on beyond just their classroom. Right, so it gets contextualized in, in, a, in a globalized world, which is the 21st century world. Amazing. It's, 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 it's really wicked. fantastic. So, uh, so I, 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 what if a teacher wants to use like, <laughs> I want teachers to use this. How do we get them to use it like next week? So we've just launched a website, aka.ms slash hacking stem. Um, that is now live and available, and if teachers would like to go to there, they can get access to the lesson plan and to the uh, instructions on how to build these. In addition, there is an invitation process to ask to be invited to come in and get the plugin to use it for Excel and the worksheet. So everything's just right there, available to them. Yep, aka.ms slash hack and stem. That's fantastic. I'm gonna I'm gonna email that uh, that link to my to my my kids' teachers right right now. This is fantastic. I guess. I mean, it's it's we should we should send it back to Sonia. All right. Or Anthony. Okay. See you in a couple minutes. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys. Jordan, you're having a little bit too much fun, but I look so forward to hearing about all the stories of the re resources on Hacking STEM and the teachers that make an impact in classrooms. Uh, it's great to see the energy and the enthusiasm, and really, Lauren's story is really inspiring before. Uh, I appreciate the connection that we have globally. We know that when you can connect classrooms, you can truly change the world. And one of the ways we do that is via Skype. I've had personally the opportunity to travel with thousands of classrooms around the world connecting with students and, and educators, learning from them as well. Uh, and Skype virtual field trips have been an amazing tool educators have used to bring knowledge into their classroom from a wide variety of resources. And our next story tells a great example of that. I'm gonna introduce Diane Smokorowski. She's a Skype master teacher, a Microsoft innovative educator expert. She was a 2013 Kansas Teacher of the Year. And Diane has been using Skype virtual field trips to open up the world to her students. Diane, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Or as we say in Kansas, howdy, hey. How's it going? Well, I'll tell you, as an educator, I feel that we are in the inspiration business. Would you agree? Our job is to inspire students not only to see what's possible, but perhaps even dream of what they could do to change the world. And Skype does that for me. And, you know, as a person who comes from middle school language arts, there's the most amazing sound that can happen in the classroom. And it sounds like this. Huh. Did you catch it? Huh. That is the sound of an eighth grade boy who's been inspired. That is that magnificent moment. And I feel that sometimes I have these superpower ears that hear it from across the room. And I'm like, oh, yes, just gotcha. That's terrific. And so when I use things like Skype, I can hear those little huh moments all over the classroom because now we're making personal connections with other people that they can interview, ask questions, discover, and see what inspires others that perhaps will inspire them as well. And one of the ways that we'll start doing this is with a Mystery Skype. How many folks have played Mystery Skype? Yay! And for those of you who are unaware of what Mystery Skype is, there is a game of 20 questions played through a Skype call. It generally starts with mystery location, so only the teachers know one another's location. Then the students play the game of 20 questions. Are you north of the equator? Are you east of Mississippi River? And eventually they narrow it down to where one is located and the other. And then this is where the magic happens. Now you get to ask questions. What is it like to live in Kansas? That's a big question that we get. <laughs> what is it like to live in Kansas? But what is it like to live in Edinburgh? What is it like to live in Romania, in South Africa, in Australia? All of these things just open opportunities for students to make connections with others. And if you go to the mysteryskypeonenote.com, you can download a free OneNote 
that goes with any computer system to see other ideas from other Skype teachers on how they use Skype in the classroom and get started with Mystery Skype. But for me, the most wonderful piece of all is that it opens doors to cultures and perspectives. Coming from the middle of the United States, we are considered a flyover state. <laughs> we get to wave at folks when they fly over us. But I will tell you that the most wonderful thing is in Kansas, we are kind of like the best hidden secret because we connect with the whole world and make open doors for perspectives. One of the things that we do is a project that I invented called Awesome Squiggles. You love the name, don't you? And when you take a look at the Awesome Squiggles, we upload a set of four lines. They change every year, but we put them on a website and we ask students, what do you see? So I challenge you now, do you see an animal? Do you see a water scene? Perhaps you see four distinct images. Hmm. And you could rotate it if you wish to see it from a different perspective that way. We ask children all over the world to download this image and show us what you see. How many of you do see or did see the elephant? Did anybody see the elephant? We had a few. Did anybody see an ocean scene? A few of our audience members do as well. Would you like to see what the students saw? You can see the lines have not moved. They may have been rotated, but they're exactly where they should be at this point. The snake at the top was that swirly line you saw before. Rotate the image. And now we have balloons. And it's now we're having a conversation about art. And we have a conversation starter that shows the creativity of one child to another. One of my favorites. In this one, you'll notice that they've chosen a different art medium. We really are giving the students the opportunity to choose what art medium reflects what you want to say the most. So this one is done with chalk. And I love that that swirly line you saw before is now the candle smoke. And because it's an international project, they come in from all over the world. This one is from China. And if you'll notice, it is an ocean scene. There's a small sailing boat in the center on the horizon. But you'll notice that the art also is changing by culture. And when we start seeing powerful pieces come in, now we can talk about focus, negative space, color, movement, all of the concepts in art just because one student saw one thing compared to another. And when you get to the part where cats are dreaming of fish, now you have a wonderful conversation ready to go. We challenge students to not only complete the art, but then we, when you register for our project, we help you connect with another class of similar age. And you can have a conversation. The children bring their artwork up to the screen and say, I have a cat that's dreaming of fish. What did you see? And it's a powerful moment. Because friends, even if we all don't speak the same language, art, the arts themselves, are a language of their own. And another great opportunity is that you can take virtual field trips with your students in so many wonderful places. We can go to a sea turtle rescue hospital. I don't know about you, but I can already see my second and third grade students of our district go, Whoa, those aren't the turtles like what we see in our community. Those look amazing. Or you can take a virtual Skype call underwater, 60 feet, to Aquarius. How many of you think that is awesome? That is awesome. We can go to discover the pieces of history, like to the Virginia Historical Society. You can even do a Skype call with a scientist sitting in the Antarctic amongst penguins having Q&A opportunities with students. I don't know about you, but that's awesome, right? I, it just makes me happy in so many ways. You can even go to places such as Yellowstone National Park, among other places. And it's really not that hard to set up. Would you like to know how to do this? Sure. Can I show you? All right, here we go. It's super simple. When you go to education.microsoft.com, you are going to see a section over on the left-hand side that is for Skype in the classroom. And I'm gonna log in just real quickly here. 
And what's really cool is that I can sign in with my Skype ID or with my Microsoft ID. Super simple all the way around to make that happen. So let me just log in here real quickly. And when we get to the website, over on the left-hand side, now we have the ability to scroll down and see the virtual field trips. When I click on that, you'll see several of them that are featured on the page. And do you remember I just told you about going to see penguins in the Antarctic? That's not the only penguin opportunity. You can actually do one in South Africa with Sandcob. This is an animal bird rescue hospital. I'll see a little information about what the virtual field trip is, what's all involved. And then it's pretty simple. You find that amazing purple button. What color, friends? Purple is where it's at. So we click on register and a calendar will show up. Takes just a moment for it to arrive. When the calendar shows up, you'll have a list of availability from your virtual Skype partner. Well, Next week might not look real great for me, so I can go up and anywhere there's green, there's availability from your virtual Skype connection. So let's see what's happened on October 4th. Well, it looks like there's some availability for me, but you'll notice that two o'clock in the morning is not quite comfortable for Kansas <laughs> for students to join because this one is in South Africa. There's going to be a time zone opportunity here. So I'll just scroll down till 9 a.m. Notice it's picking up from my own region. Isn't that magical? So I don't have to guess what time zone it is versus my location and the other. I can even leave a little note to our friends who I'd like to connect with to tell them what we're doing in class. And as soon as I hit request a session, that sends a notification to the virtual Skype partner. And I will hear in about three days if that works really well, if that works for both of our time slots. Now, with that being said, I've already arranged for a special virtual field trip today. How many of you would like to go with us? Yes? Okay. Let's go take a look. We're going to make a phone call or a Skype call, excuse me, to North Carolina. I love that sound. I must tell you, it just makes my heart happy. Katie. Hi, how are you? I am great. And I have some awesome friends online that are excited to see you. Can everybody say good morning, Katie? Good morning. All right, Katie, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself and where you're from? All right. Well, my name is Katie Smith and I'm e-learning coordinator at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We're one of the largest science museums in the Southeast United States. And at our museum, we have a lot of really cool stuff to show students in the classroom. We have dinosaurs, live animals and researchers in labs wanting to bring science to your classroom. And that's pretty amazing. And I hear that you've brought some amazing little friends with you. I have. So today I'm going to be giving you a small sample of one of our most popular virtual field trips here at the museum called the Unhuggables. Now, this was a program I put together about two years ago after I started to get a lot of feedback from teachers about teachers, uh, students being a little bit unsure about specific types of animals that maybe they were afraid of or a little bit scared of. And so today we're going to meet some Unhuggable animals and learn a little bit more about some of the misconceptions that go along with them. How many of you are excited? Who wants to meet some Unhuggables? Fantastic. Oh. All right, Katie, tell us who your first friend is. All right, our first friend is the snake. So today we're going to be meeting a ball python. Um, and so a lot of people are afraid of snakes, and that's kind of understandable. But a lot of people don't understand is how amazingly they've adapted to their environment. Um, so here we have a ball python. These guys are found in Africa. And when we talk about snakes, we put them in two categories, venomous and non-venomous. Um, in this case, the ball python is a constrictor, which means that it kills its prey by constricting it and then eating it whole. Now, one of the things I love to tell students is about how snakes eat their prey. Now, imagine they don't have arms and legs. So exactly how do they swallow such giant food, right? Is they have special types of jaws. So I want you guys to open your mouth as wide as you can. Right? That's as wide as you're going to get because your jaw is connected. 
that if you were a snake, it would open twice the size of your head, which is pretty amazing. So this allows things like the ball python to eat animals almost twice the size of their body, right? Now, snakes come in all sizes and shapes, the largest being the reticulated python that can be found in places like the rainforest and parts of Africa. And then you have things like thread snakes that are really, really small, right? So in this case, we have the smallest snake in the world that's found in Brazil. So this is just a small sample of a snake that's been able to adapt to survive in some pretty amazing places. And we can find snakes all over the world. Now, our next unhuggable animal is an animal that's a little bit prickly. And this is one that when I show students, they, can, they typically say that it's a porcupine. Now, the main difference is this is a mammal with quills, but if you got too close to a porcupine, you might end up like this guy, right? So a little bit pokey. Now, hedgehogs are not able to actually get rid of their quills, and they are nocturnal, so we're going to have to wake this one up for a nap, so I can't guarantee that it won't be a little grumpy. Now, these guys have thousands of quills on their body, and they're really, really sharp, like hypodermic needle sharp, right? So... I have to put on my very special gloves here to hold them. Now, hedgehogs are found in only two places in the world, Europe and Africa. There he is. So, a lot of animals have special ways of being able to defend themselves. In this case, this guy is going to puff up in a little ball like this, and then the quills are going to be on the outside, and on the inside, he will be able to protect all the soft cuddly parts, right? Now, what's really cool about hedgehogs is not only do they have quills, but they have another way of protecting themselves, and we call that anointing. So they like to go find things that are a little bit stinky. Sometimes it's other animal poo, and then they wipe that with their saliva onto their quills so they can mask their smell. Now, the third thing that's really cool about hedgehogs is that they're actually immune to snake venom. So researchers have been looking at them very closely to learn a little bit more about why they have these specific type of features that allow them to survive being bit by a venomous snake. Now, the third animal that's always really popular is this guy, the tarantula. Now, the tarantula is a very misunderstood animal. A lot of people think that tarantulas can kill you. Well, I'm here to tell you that no one has ever died from a tarantula bite. Because if you were to be bitten by a tarantula, it's about the equivalent of being stung by a bee. So just because a spider is really big doesn't necessarily mean that it's more dangerous. So for example, the black widow, which is a pretty small spider, um, has a concentration of venom that is very, very powerful. Now the largest spider in the world is the Goliath birdie that's found in South America. Now one thing I think that's really cool about tarantulas is that they have these special types of hairs called urticating hairs, which allows them to be able to flick them at you, right? So they use that as a defense mechanism, and they also are venomous, right? So that's another really cool feature of tarantulas. Now, the other thing is they can actually regrow their body parts. So like lizards and some other types of animals, they can regenerate. If you drop a tarantula, it's actually able to regrow any body parts that break off, which not all spiders can do, which is a, a pretty amazing feat. And then the last animal that I'm going to show you is the largest reptile in North America. And I think you're going to know what animal this is, the alligator. Now, we're really lucky here in North Carolina that we have a population of them, so they're mostly found in the southeast. And the one I have to show you today is a juvenile American alligator. Um, and so here he is right here. So we'll get him up for you to see. And we know it's a juvenile because it has the stripes. Um, and so we like to talk a little about why this is such a really cool animal, mostly because it is kind of a living fossil. They've been on Earth for millions of years, dating all the way back to Sarcosuchus, its ancestor, which actually roamed the land during the time of the dinosaurs. So this is just a small sample of some of the animals that your students will get to meet on a virtual field trip to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Katie, that is incredible. And I know just in the, in the, off, uh, the audience here, and I'm sure online as well, we had some reactions when they saw the hedgehog is like, oh, how cute. Or if we and saw <laughs> some of them see the snake, a few people like caps their breasts like, oh, it's a snake. 
But it's, you know, the best part about these opportunities is not only are they free for any teacher anywhere, but now we can start to get rid of misconceptions and learn about animals in a really great, exciting way. What are some of the most popular questions that you are asked? Oh, that's a great one. So I get such amazing questions from students. Um, of course, I always get uh, questions like, what do they eat? Where are they found? Um, especially with the alligator, they like to know, can I have it as a pet, which I don't always recommend, of course. Um, but this is a great opportunity for a lot of students at the end of the program will say, I really did not like spiders, but now I think tarantulas are my favorite animal. So I think it's a great experience to introduce some of these animals that might be a little bit afraid, but it's in a safe environment through Skype in the classroom. Terrific. And, you know, you do several of these virtual field trips. Do you have any advice for teachers before they make a connection? Yeah. So when you contact um, us at the museum or any other site, I always recommend to maybe have about three dates and times in mind when you're ready to schedule and also take into consideration time difference. Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to accommodate that time. Let's say if you're on the East Coast or even somewhere else in the world. Also, um, be able to prepare your students for what the experience is going to be like, right? So we're going to be connecting virtually. So having them be able to sit where I can see them and communicate effectively. And then the third thing I would recommend would be to do a test connection. So we're always here and available to do that. So we always recommend that we connect ahead of time of the program to help you troubleshoot any issues that might arise. Fantastic. I'm sending you a cyber high five, Katie. That was awesome. All right. Thanks so much. And maybe we have a few questions. Yeah, I think we do. Do we have any questions from, um, sorry, I hope Katie's still there. Um, if not, questions for Diane or Katie on Skype virtual field trips. Anyone? Eve, got anyone from online? Yes, we have a couple of on, uh, online. Uh, I think the one uh, uh, you already mentioned, they're asking, uh, uh, Lori Yager from the U.S. is asking, what is the cost to a virtual field trip? All the virtual field trips at Skype in the Classroom are completely free. All you need is a device, a webcam, and speakers, and you can go around the world. Great. And also there is a question from Patricia uh, Regan-Stokes in the U.S. Uh, who's asking um, uh, I, if they have a partner or an interesting institution that they want to nominate uh, to be part of a virtual field trip. Can they do that? Absolutely. I think if you go into education.microsoft.com, click on Skype in the Classroom, there is a way for you to connect and share some of these organizations. The more opportunities that we have groups connecting or other classrooms, the more doors we can open for children. Absolutely. All right, and one final question from Julie, and then we'll wrap up this segment. So I have a question about how younger students can participate in mystery uh, Skype, because sometimes it's hard for them to understand about states. Is there something that my kindergarten, first or second graders can do with Skype? That's a great question. A lot of times we'll play mystery number with those little kids of saying, I, I'm imagining a number between one and 50. Is it higher than 22 and so forth? That's a great way to start with littles. Uh, we've also seen mystery animal. Does your animal have two legs? Does he have four legs? Uh, does he have no legs? <laughs> we've seen mystery authors and even mystery careers. Anything that you can have for students to start as a conversation is a great way to begin with littles. Great question. Awesome. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Um, gosh, I just have to say, these chairs are super fun to sit in. They are. They're <laughs> awesome, actually. These are from Steelcase, one of our partners oh, for today's event. Awesome. By the way, that was amazing, that session. Uh, Katie does amazing work in, in her museum in North yeah. Carolina. I wish I was in Diane's class. That I was know. just awesome. Yeah, I, my sister-in-law actually just asked me to come be a guest speaker because they can actually only afford one field trip this year. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to that school and show all the teachers how to do Skype virtual field trips so they can take their kids around the world. Great. So, Anthony, what do we have coming up next here? Um, I do believe we have a, another class, class hack, hack I think. Yeah. yeah. Class hacks have been amazing. Our next one comes from one of our, our most popular Microsoft Innovative Educator experts, Sandy Adams from the US. So let's hear how Sandy Adams is using docs.com in interesting ways in her classroom. Awesome. My class hack will show you how to create a collection of links in docs.com. First, I'm going to go to Add New. Click on Collection. I'm going to title this Sway Project. I can change my permissions. And then I'm going to click Create New Collection. My collection opens. I have a great background, or I could add my own. I'm going to select Add Links. 
Because I collected all my student sway links through a form, I can just copy these links. I can paste them. And now all I have to do to add these to my collection is just click the plus sign, scroll to the top, click done, and now I have an awesome page in Docs that I can share to all of my parents so they can see their students' sways. Thanks, Sandy, and thanks for all the class hacks, and continue to le leverage them on the website in the resource section um, above. I want to do some more shout outs. We've got some amazing educators sharing their energy. Uh, please, uh, thanks for joining today. Thanks for all the, the Hack the Classroom uh, activity on Twitter. Shout outs to Nigeria, shout outs to Slovakia, Scotland. Uh, amazing efforts, and thanks for the energy and participation throughout the day. Our next speaker is from Mexico, and she's a teacher, a science and technology teacher in grades six and seven in the American Institute in Monterey. And she's using Minecraft to share the excitement of STEM with her classroom. And let's hear a little bit from Patricia about how that goes. Patricia, thanks for joining today. Thank you, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Four years ago, I started uh, hearing a lot about game-based learning. So I said, how can I use this uh, technology in my classroom with my students? So I start giving permission to myself to actually become a learner as well. As you know, Minecraft is a world without limits. It's a world in which the limit is only established by the imagination of my students. And actually it has become much more than a game. It has become actually for many of my students how they develop certain skills and at the same time they express themselves. So I would like to share with you nine habits that I started using when I started using Minecraft four years ago and they were very helpful for me and hopefully for you they're going to be as helpful uh, when you start using Minecraft. The first one, don't be afraid. I have to tell you something, but don't tell anyone. I'm not a gamer, okay? But I'm a teacher, so I decided to go for it. And I had support from my students, which actually they were the ones that were the experts. So we all together decided to create our very own uh, Minecraft club. Okay, our students, that uh, the day in which they were going to be announcing uh, the Minecraft Club, I pasted a little paper on my classroom so they had to sign in for the classroom. I was hoping to have five, six, probably seven students because they were the ones that are going to have sacrificed their uh, recess in order to be in the Minecraft Club. So what was my surprise that I have a bunch of students right there waiting to be in, my, in, the, in the club. I have mixed feelings. On one side, I was extremely happy because I was uh, knowing that this project was actually going to be a success. But on the other hand, I was kind of scared because I was going to start walking a path I have I've never been there before. I think that one of my best decisions was to start small. I started with a club rather to jumping in directly to the curriculum. So that way I could figure out the students what they were doing and me starting to learn exactly what we were going through. So I think that was one of my best decisions. Uh, one thing that they love is that they say that they were going to be actually playing in my class, but little did they know that they were actually developing 21st century skills, which were collaboration, problem, solve, problem solving, critical thinking, and many more. Tip number three, get organized. This is very important. So when we started the Minecraft Club, the, the school was not providing yet accounts. So what we decided to do was actually to uh, start using the personal accounts of the students. But now it's very easy so to, for the students to have access and go into the Minecraft platform. Another one that I think it's extremely important, which is number four, is to plan ahead. Students, as soon as they arrive to your classroom, they want to jump into the computer and start building. 
but what are you going to build if you don't even know? So the first thing that you need to do, although they don't like it that much, is actually to plan. You need to plan, you have to have a blueprint in order for the students to know which part of the project you're gonna be doing and the part of the project that they're going to be responsible. Remember that the goal could be to introduce a topic or to practice a skill or demonstrate learning. Tip number five, empower your students. There are two ways in you can play uh, Minecraft. One is the creative mode and the other one is the survival mode. For the ones that are not familiar, creative mode is when you have all the resources and you can just actually start building. And on the other hand, the one of the survival mode is that you have to look for the material in order for the students to start uh, building. So I decided to make a difference in the classroom and I had like some students, they were creative, my leaders, and the other ones were the survivals. So that helped me get organized and my students needed to plan because they asked for material for the creative students and they have to know like what type of material they were going to use, the amount of material, and then my creative mode students will provide the, the um, elements that they needed. But this is also good because they were actually looking forward in order for them to become creative more. Number six, sex set rules. Extremely important. We have to tell the students that just like in a normal life, in, in real life, it, it's, we also need to have in virtual uh, platforms, we have to need uh, set rules. In this case, there are two rules that I will highly recommend that you talk with your students. First is that never destroy anything that you haven't built because that can cause a huge problem in your classroom. And number two is that as you know, you can blow things up with TNT in Minecraft. So you just have to be careful and make sure that when you're going to be using TNT, you are uh, supervised by the teacher or by the leaders, because I've seen things blown out proportionately, <laughs> okay? But remember, it's also important to give them some freedom. So if there are students that they want to construct using potions, go ahead, you can do it. Or I have a student that she likes to construct riding a horse, well, then you can construct that way. Rule number seven, build a team. It is very important that you set the rules for your club because uh, one important thing here is that you're gonna be showcasing what you're gonna be doing. That is very important, but in order to showcase, you need to be part of the Minecraft club and present yourself at least once per week. It's very important because sometimes students, they just appear at the beginning of the school year and then after six months when we are ready to present our show, they just bump, bump out and we say, you know what, you have to come all the, all, during all the session, but you, the rules have to be set. Number eight, celebrate your learning. Showcase what you have done. Don't let what your students have done stay in the four walls of your classroom. It is very important that everyone see what they have done. And you as educators know that the perspective of the students change totally once they start actually uh, knowing that someone else is going to be seeing what you are going to be showcasing. So it is very important that everyone knows that they will have an opportunity to expose what they are doing. Actually, in our school, we have a technology symposium in which we uh, give the opportunity for the students to showcase what they have done to teachers, to other uh, members of our community, to uh, parents, and they really become very uh, sensitive about what they have done and excited as well. Number nine, grow your project. Now the Minecraft Club has evolved. We started, as I mentioned, four years ago, and now it started to be part of the curriculum. It's just not a part of a club. So we are very excited about this. And our, our latest achievement was to have a, a presentation together with the Latin American Network of Mentor Schools by Minecraft, the, guided by Felipe Prado. So what we did is that different schools around Latin America, I'm talking about Puerto Rico, other schools from Mexico, uh, Chile, we made a project together in which we make like a simulation of a natural disaster that happened in each one of our communities. And then we created a simulation to prevent that natural disaster. 
That was extraordinary for our students. As you can see here, we had a Skype call and our students were showcasing what they did and everyone was receiving feedback and actually giving, a, a giving and receiving feedback, which was very enriching for the students. Now, since I couldn't bring my students to, to here with me today, I brought a video that we made in our classroom. Well, the American Institute of Monterey was founded in 1968, has been known for its academic excellence, its educational innovation, and its service to the community, and to the importance of using gaming in the educational aspects of our school. The most unique aspect that I have found when using Minecraft is the way the students react towards the way they're learning. They actually think they're playing and they love what they're doing and for them they can stay hours. Very creative game and well it has helped me expand my imagination a lot. I've learned creativity, teamwork and planning with time. I learned to be part of a team and help each other out and listen to each other. What I learned with the Minecraft Club uh, is that every problem has a solution and the Minecraft Club has given me the skills to find that solution. I think that uh, Minecraft is a wonderful game to use in education because certainly you can combine all of the 21st century skills that are needed for our students. Uh, obviously there's critical thinking, there's creativity, there's collaboration, uh, there's problem solving. In Minecraft I have learned that you can do a lot of things, building, surviving, playing with friends, making contests, etc. I think many of the things we made in Minecraft could be taken into the real world. For example, the school was taken from the real world into the Minecraft world, but some things can be taken from Minecraft to the real world. I'm really, really proud of the project of San like this campus that uh, we built at school. It's one of the most, it's one of the projects where I had a lot of fun and where it just, it helped me also to see all the school and to learn a bit more of proportions. You know, you tackle uh, geometry, math, geology, a little bit of everything. And since I formed part of the Minecraft Club, I've learned the skills that I'm going to need in my life, that it's teamwork, because of very important, because of the work, you're always going to be working with other people. I'm totally aware and I am pretty sure that my students have gained skills that they didn't even know that they gained so far. Certainly we'd like to thank Microsoft for its long-standing support of the American Institute of Monterrey and the use of technology for education. The results are apparent. Our kids are excited about learning, our teachers are innovators, and the impact in our school and in the outer society is great. So thank you very much, Microsoft. This has been a great experience for me and for my students. To close, I would like to leave you with a challenge. Start small. Do something anywhere, somewhere, but start. Think big, be ambitious, expect more. Students are ready to take the risk. Are you? Hack the classroom. Thanks. Thanks so much, Patricia. Those were amazing uh, ideas and guides for us. And certainly I thank you for your energy and bravery. And it's great to see the excitement for Minecraft Education Edition. When I travel around the world, it's often one of the things that I get asked most about with students who are collaborating, sharing ideas, uh, asking me for tips and tricks. I'm not an expert at Minecraft, but I've learned so much from uh, listening to the energy and enthusiasm students have. So it's great to see that happening uh, in your classroom in Mexico. One of the things I'm curious about is how our Sway is coming along. Let's check in with Prita to see how the, the Sway is developing. Prita? Hey guys, so I'm right here going to go to aka.ms slash Sway the Hack, and you can see what I've been up to for the last couple hours. And so what I've been doing is pulling in photos from all the speakers, tweets, just so we can see the excitement. 
and I will go ahead and play. And you will be able to get, have access to all the PowerPoint presentations and videos that you've seen today. So here are some of the tweets we've found, pictures from the Hack the STEM project that's going on in just the other room, the deck in case you'd like to replicate that in your classroom, pictures. Again, as I mentioned, you'll be able to swipe through these PowerPoint presentations in case you're curious to see John's slides. And you'll see this basically for every single speaker um, throughout this way. Think of this as your digital handout um, in case you ever want to revisit what you learned today. That's awesome, Preeta. I can't wait to take a look at that sway after today's session. Uh, before we check back in with, with Jordan and Karen, uh, we want to ha have our final class hack. And our final class hack comes from Jorge Braga in Portugal. I love this one. Uh, because it's our viewer choice winner, as well as it has an interesting title, So the Projector Lamp Exploded. I'm intrigued. Let's watch the hack. You are teaching a STEM class in a lab where each student has their own computer. You need to teach the usage of application like Excel. You turn on the projector and kaboom, lamp just exploded. How to show your screen to all your students? Why not use Skype to host a virtual classroom? You have Skype. Your students have Skype. To easily do that, you go into your Office 365 account and create a new calendar event. You had a Skype meeting to this event and your students as attendees. You already are the organizer of the virtual classroom. You hit send to send the invitation to the selected students. The students receive the invitation as a calendar event and can easily join the virtual classroom, either through the desktop client app or through the client meetings web app. When you have everyone in the virtual classroom, you can start sharing your screen or whatever you want. And best of all, you save energy. The projector is off. Thanks, Jorge. Great hack. Uh, and now let's check in with Karen and Jordan and see how the Hacking STEM project is going. Hey, as you can tell, we've moved outside. I'm standing out here in the driveway outside of the building um, here in Redmond. And I've been joined by two amazing local STEM teachers, uh, Jason and James. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm James Burke from Taiyi Middle School in Bellevue. Jason Ewart from Rose Hill Middle School in Redmond, Washington. Well, this is really cool. <laughs> you got to tell us what's going on here. All right, what we've got going here is we've taken the anemometer, but we've attached it to a near space research balloon. And what we're going to be doing is taking our anemometer readings from the read sensor switch enabled device and wirelessly transmitting it to our Excel spreadsheet using a, just a regular Bluetooth chip that we've attached to our Arduino board. Launched off that balloon. Exactly, wirelessly fed. And you did all of this using the same kind of parts, paper, paper cups, sticks, straws. The only thing that's changed is the little Bluetooth module that's been placed on the Arduino board. Everything is exactly the same. I need an anemometer to figure out how much my mind is blown right now. <laughs> hey, Jason, why would we do this? And what would this add to our classroom? And well, this is just a great example of just seeing the whole process from engineers uh, iterating, prototyping, using the design process to design data measuring instruments. And then once they have those dialed in, they can send them out to the field scientists so that they can be deployed in the field and actually go out and collect data. And you know, later on that can be analyzed and used to make predictions, discuss trends, do all kinds of great stuff with quantitative data. That's amazing. So I think we should try and go ahead and launch it. Now, I mean, if you do remember from the Beaufort scale, um, we don't have a lot of wind, but let's go up and see what we have. Well, let's check. The well, first thing we're going to do is make sure that we have our wireless connection to the device taken care of. So let's make sure that it's working first. All right, that sounds good. Okay, you ready, James? Yes. We are now simulating wind. And there you go. You can see that the uh, device is working. We're getting a wind speed data from that, so we're good to go. Okay, so yeah. I think we should start to take it up. We're going to launch it now? We're launching it now. All right. Here we go. This is so climactic. I know. <laughs> so why, in, would, why would we do this um, in terms of the, the globalness of this? Well, the whole point of this project here is to turn the students' work and integrate it into a citizen's uh, weather observation program. 
we can actually take this data and wirelessly feed it into a internet network of global weather people and people from all around the world could find out what the weather is like in your community. You know, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, what, what kind of readings are we getting? Well, right now we're getting a Beaufort scale of around zero to one. The winds are <laughs> not very much happening today. But that's yeah. still data. But data, even no wind, is a data point for a scientist. <laughs> well, and being here in Seattle and that it's actually sunny, that is not a bad thing at all. We actually appreciate that it's not raining and that we're not being blown around out here while we're, we're doing this. Um, where, how far can I take it up and, and what, you know, what, what, what could I learn if I left it for a couple of days? Well, currently um, we're using a Bluetooth module, so you're looking at anywhere what the distance is of your Bluetooth module. Right now we're at about 30 meters is about the maximum that we can get. So you can calculate and get data from any level of the atmosphere that you want up to 90 meters or 30 meters with a Bluetooth module. Have you, now you guys have done this with actual students, yeah? James has. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I've, I've, uh, I've been getting a lot of great information with James, but I think James can elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, we actually do near space research. We launch these weather balloons up to 110,000 feet and uh, record the data on the device itself. And then we recover that. Uh, device and then we download the data and analyze it. Wow, so you use like a GPS to go recover it? Yes, we have a GPS module then broadcast through a shortwave radio network called APERS and then we can track that anywhere it goes and then recover it and then download the data. I, I, I mean, th this is fantastic. I, like, I imagine when kids use this, like, it really hits home, it really sticks in a way that, 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 that's, that, that, that just doesn't happen from the, from, from the way we're used to learning. I never learned any way like this. Well, it's just a great example of authentic learning and assessment for teachers and students in the classrooms. You know, you can, um, so much neat, you know, we talked about the engineering and the science involved with it, but it's all applied now. And so students are very motivated to, you know, learn how to do this stuff, learn the calculations behind measuring wind speed, employ that into their, into their code when they're working on the computer science component. And it's just a cool way to motivate kids because they want this thing to work. Wow. Now, in addition, we also have a uh, GoPro camera connected to the bottom of the payload. So we are using a Wi-Fi signal, and we can actually get a visual interpretation of the data along with the numbers being sent in from the anemometer. So this is pretty awesome. All of the instructions and examples of how this is, what you could do this are, are going to be as part of AKA slash MS but aka.ms slash hacking stem and including the lesson plan and the assessment and your you guys wrote that lesson plan is that not correct uh, that is correct and everything is there and any questions uh, we have a feedback forum where you can get in touch with all the other scientists students around the world and get that information conveyed fantastic and I see that Anthony is here this is awesome <laughs> I can't, ex uh, I can't express how excited I am to see the balloon, to see the opportunities with the Hacking STEM project. Thanks for the great work, uh, guys, uh, to really make this available for educators around the world. Uh, no problem. We appreciate it. Appreciate Are we going to get a chance to see that, that GoPro image later? Um, we might be able to. Let's see if we maybe, can connect Maybe we can take that. some selfies for everyone. <laughs> but uh, as we wrap up, well, here, James, you want the mic? Oh, yeah. Um, right now, my uh, teammate has the connected to his phone right now. If we could get him over here, we could watch the image. That's the nice local feed. Maybe turn it around. Maybe we can do a selfie with the image here. <laughs> All of us looking up, we get, we get a selfie from up high. <laughs> awesome. Well, first off, thanks for, very much for the work. It's been an amazing experience. Uh, Hack the Classroom has been a joy for me. It's been exciting. We've learned a lot uh, just from the uh, opportunities that you've been sharing, the resources that were shared with John, really changing the, the thinking of how we can inspire students with creativity. We learned a lot um, from Lauren about how we can leverage learning tools as a powerful tool with inside of OneNote. Uh, certainly saw some great examples of Skype virtual field trips with Diane. Uh, had great opportunities to hear from Patricia with Minecraft. Uh, it's been an amazing opportunity to learn from amazing educators who are changing the opportunities for their students in their classrooms. You all inspire us every single day with the work that you're doing. We're excited to celebrate you in events like this, hopefully provide resources that you can make actionable in your classrooms with your students with powerful tools that are designed for educators every single day. I'm excited to talk a little bit about our next event to celebrate not only you, but the opportunities of virtual learning. We know that when we connect classrooms, we can truly change the world. 
Our next event is the Skypeathon. This is an exciting event. I had an opportunity to participate in it last year, uh, and it was truly amazing. In 48 hours last year, we traveled over 5 million virtual miles with Skype. I know we can beat that this year, and our next Skypeathon is coming up on November 29th and 30th of this year. So I, I'm excited to not only celebrate with all of you to learn from you and your students, but to celebrate the power of virtual classrooms and field trips. So hopefully we can inspire more folks uh, like Katie in North Carolina to be giving virtual field trips to your students. I'm excited about that. You guys excited about that? We are completely Maybe we can so. talk about this project. And one of the things we're gonna do is put the Hacking STEM projects as one of the features for virtual classrooms uh, via Skype, uh, the Skypeathon that's coming up, so we can learn about how educators are using these tools. That's, that's fantastic. We are really excited to be able to participate. Awesome. So, on behalf of Microsoft, certainly uh, in beautiful and sunny Se <laughs> Seattle, Washington, uh, thanks for participating. And, windla and windless. And windless, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, the, the wind doesn't cooperate as, as you'd like, but certainly uh, thanks very much for joining. Thanks for the work that you do every single day. You are heroes. You inspire us. And hope you enjoyed Hack the Classroom. Take advantage of the resources. Take advantage of the online materials and continue to tweet out uh, the impact that you've had and certainly share your stories. Take advantage of the, the sway that Preta created. Uh, and thanks for all you do every single day on behalf of your students and changing the world in your classrooms. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>